When Patrick Hamilton left the family mansion near Linlithgow, Scotland, to travel to Europe, that was back in 1526, few imagined that this young man with royal blood in his veins would return one year later as an accomplished preacher of the biblical Protestant faith. Even fewer could have predicted back then that within just a few months of his return to Scotland, he would be burnt at a stake in St. Andrews on the orders of the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Scotland. He would be the first martyr for the Lord Jesus Christ in the cause of the Scottish Reformation. Coming into that 16th century, The land of Scotland had been held in the darkness of Roman Catholicism for coming on four centuries. Rome's grip upon the country was total. The throne back then was weak, so the king was no obstacle to their um, desire for power. The nobles were divided into factions. The people were sunken in ignorance. And so all of these factors gave the Roman Catholic bishops and abbots free reign to fill all the influential positions at the king's court and to discharge the highest offices in the state. They were chancellors. They were secretaries of state. They were the members of the judiciary. They were the ambassadors. They led armies, fought battles, tried and executed criminals. And yes, they also executed faithful preachers of the gospel too. The first Tyndale Bible came into Scotland around 1525. And it began by its reading and spread to shed some gracious light in Scotland. But what Scotland really needed then was a spark somewhere in the country to ignite and through that to spread the Protestant Reformed faith across the entire face of the nation. It needed, in the words of one historian, the living voice of the preacher and the fiery stake of the confessor to arouse the nation from the dead sleep in which it was sunk. And it found both the living voice of a preacher who was preaching the Bible that was being translated into their language and also Not only the living voice of the preacher, but the fiery stake of the confessor. It found both of these in the person of Patrick Hamilton. In 1526, when he was 23 years of age, Patrick Hamilton began to hear rumblings about men who were teaching the word of God in Europe. Now he was primed to be a formidable noble in the land of Scotland because of his royal lineage. Patrick Hamill was connected to the throne both through his mother and his father's families. He had a great education at the University of Paris. And again, that would have meant that he would have carved out a considerable position within the country of Scotland. But with a passion in his heart, he left his homeland to find and to meet with the heroes of the faith in that day over on the continent of Europe. He went from country to country, eventually traveled to Germany, where he met with William Tyndale, John Frith, Martin Luther, and Francis Lambert. Hamilton checked into Wittenberg in Germany at the best possible time in history to visit. He met the herald who was shaking the planet with his pen, Martin Luther. It was just six years at that time after the Diet of Worms where Luther had been called upon to renounce the truth of salvation by the Roman Catholic Church and also to reaffirm the heretical teaching of the Catholic Church. Hamilton then, coming into Luther's presence, would have heard about this great event from the mouth of the man who uttered these words to the rulers of the world in that day, unless I am convicted by Scripture and plain reason. I do not accept the authority of popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything, 
For to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. Amen. The one who uttered those words, Martin Luther, welcomed Patrick Hamilton into his home. And he sat and he dined with Martin Luther and his wife of two years, Katharina von Borum. And to hear the story, as he would have done firsthand, of how she is an unheard of salvation by grace through faith, embraced that truth, he escaped the clutches of the Catholic Church and found her way into Luther's life. The story he heard would have moved Patrick Hamilton's soul. But to be able as well to sit at the base of Luther's pulpit, sing in thunderous accord with the hymns that Luther penned, hear the glories of Christ preached from the word of God, would have been the highlight of all. Hamilton heard how Christ's death on the cross was the perfect sacrifice for God the Father, that Christ was the only worthy sacrifice, that salvation comes by grace alone, through faith alone. Hamilton there also linked up with Francis Lambert. At the College of Marburg, a most remarkable man indeed, many have claimed that Francis Lambert had a greater and a clearer understanding of the truth as it is in Jesus than even Martin Luther did. But after receiving this teaching at the feet of these mighty reformers, Patrick Hamilton's heart was burning with desire for his own countrymen back home. He wanted them to hear the same message and to embrace the same Lord Jesus Christ. So he left Europe and he headed back to bring the light of Christ to Scotland. Despite the obvious dangers that were posed to him by the Roman Catholic Church and its control over the entire nation, Hamilton got out there and he began. Scotland to openly preach the doctrines of the Reformed faith. And in a very short space of time, this living voice of the preacher travelled right down the east coast of Scotland as far as St. Andrews, that was the religious capital of Scotland at that time. And that voice travelled right into the ear of the Roman Catholic Archbishop who had his seat there in St. Andrews. Now that Archbishop James Beaton, all he wanted was to erect a stake and burn Hamilton on the spot, wipe him off the face of the earth. But he knew, given the connections that Hamilton had to the kingly line, given the might and influence of the Hamilton family behind him, it was not going to be easy to wipe him out. So he hatched a clever plan. As a means of gathering as much evidence as possible against this heretic Lutheran, he invited him to a meeting, gave him total liberty to preach and teach his new doctrines in St. Andrews itself. And the Archbishop's plan was that as he preached away in St. Andrews, the whole city would gather out and they would hear him and would then be in a position to bear witness against Patrick Hamilton. Now, that young Scottish reformer was not naive. He knew what was happening. He knew what was in the Archbishop's mind, but he had a name. And his aim was, in the time given to him, no matter how long that time or how short that time would be, he wanted to tell as many people possible... Clearly tell them, lovingly tell them about the grace of Christ over against the repressive demands of the church. Hamilton's influence in St. Andrews became so great that James Beaton, the archbishop, hastily decided we need to arrest him and put a stop to this preaching. And they did that one cold night. Then they brought him out and he used all the information they had collected for the space of the past month while he'd been preaching in St. Andrews. All the material out of Hamilton's sermons, they used it to sentence him to death and publicly burn him in St. Andrews in front of the university. And so they raised by his execution in Scotland the fiery stake of the confessor. The living voice of the preacher had been heard. Now the fiery stake of the confessor had been raised 29th of February, 1528. That morning, the people crowded to the cathedral. The primate passed from the castle with a long train of 
bishops and abbots and priors and doctors, and he took a seat on the bench of the tribunal of heresy that morning. They had one spokesman, Friar Alexander Campbell, who admitted in private that everything that Patrick Hamilton was preaching in public was right. But they brought Friar Alexander Campbell, had him read articles of accusation against Patrick Hamilton and read them out, they told him, with a loud voice and arguing that all of his teachings were heretical. But Hamilton gently and ably defended himself. Eventually, that man accusing him ran out of things to say. And he turned floundering back to the tribunal bench for fresh instructions. And the bishops told him, stop arguing, call this reformer a heretic to his face, and justify that insult by overwhelming him with new accusations. And so Alexander Campbell looked again at Patrick Hamilton, cried out, heretic! Brother, that reformer mildly interrupted, you do not think me heretic. But they accused him that day of being a heretic and burned him to death because, number one, he encouraged all men to read the word of God, especially the New Testament. They took issue with him regarding the word of the Lord. Here is what they said, heretic. Thou saidst it was lawful to all men to read the word of God and especially the New Testament. Hamilton replied, I wot not if I said so, but I say now. It is reason and lawful to all men that have souls to read the word of God. And that they are able to understand the same and in particular the latter will and testament of Christ Jesus, whereby they may acknowledge their sins and repent of the same and amend their lives by faith and repentance and come to the mercy of God by Jesus Christ. And we in our hearts would say amen to that for that courageous stand. But here he is, about to go to the stake before this Roman Catholic tribunal, being put down and branded as a heretic because he was encouraging all men to read God's word. Of course, Patrick Hamilton loved the word of God himself, and he longed that everybody else in Scotland should come to know it too. When he had arrived over in Europe the previous year, at that stage, William Tyndale was a third of the way through his translating of the Bible into English. Hamilton would have been amazed in Europe at the medium of print because Tyndale was the first to use this to greatly increase the distribution of the scriptures of God. To sit at the feet of Tyndale, hear the zeal of this man who had a passion in his heart that his countrymen in England would hear God's word and receive it in their language and read it in their own language to have that passion be led to him. Well, it was infectious. And Patrick Hamilton would have been sucked up by that kind of passion. And again, Luther over there in Europe, just five years previous, had published the first Bible in German. And Hamilton in Luther's house could hold that Bible that man already had died for. Over in Europe he'd been feasting, he said, at a banquet of the word while his brethren back home in Scotland were starving and he longed for them that they might hear this truth and embrace that which had transformed him. Hamilton gave himself to the earnest study. Of God's word. He had a deep grasp of scripture. That grasp of the Bible that he had at one in respect and esteem from that great reformer over there, Francis Lambert. And later when Hamilton died, Lambert said this young man of the illustrious family of the Hamiltons came from the end of the world, from Scotland to your academy in order to be fully established in God's truth. I have hardly ever met a man who expressed himself with so much spirituality and truth on the word of the Lord. When Hamilton got back to Scotland, 
he began preaching up at his own home in Kincaval near Linlithgow. And he began to preach the foundation of the Reformation by grace. Are ye saved through faith? His family, many around in the villages by that Linlithgow district, were among his first converts. And with boldness and Christ-like love, Patrick Hamilton went from village to village to village, teaching, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And his straightforwardness, combined with his courteous manner, allied to the theme of his learning, won the hearts of many. It was said of him that going out into the fields... He would join himself to groups of laborers as they rested at noon and exhort them. This is why we read John 6 today. Verse 27 in particular, he would exhort those field laborers that while they were laboring for the meat that perisheth, not to be unmindful of that which endures unto eternal life. And opening the sacred volume. He would explain to that rustic congregation the mysteries of the kingdom which was now come unto them. And he would bid them to strive to enter in. William Blakey writes, Never did the silver trumpet sound more sweetly or richly as it fell on the ears of men who had never heard it before. It was at once recognized as the trumpet of heaven. Predictably, Rome did not want any trumpet of truth or trumpet of heaven to be blown in the land. After all, for centuries before and after, their practice was to round up people with Bibles, burn the Bibles, burn the people who had them, burn the people along with their Bibles. Some reformers burned at the stake with their Bible attached to their necks. Now, what is this saying to us, and how should it affect us? Like Patrick Hamilton, we need to learn this book. We need to love it with a real deep-set passion as well. We need to spread it. And God create, for only he can, a passion within our heart that our fellow countrymen would hear and understand what the word of God says. The word of the Lord. They sentenced him because he wanted every man to read it and understand it. And also because he was pointing the way to life. Patrick Hamilton said at this trial it was but lost labor. To call upon saints and in particular on the Virgin Mary as mediators to God for us. They said about him, heretic, thou sayest, they were quoting from the sermons of course, thou sayest. It is but lost labor to pray to or call upon saints, and in particular on the Blessed Virgin Mary, or John, James, Peter, or Paul, as mediators to God for us. Hamilton said in response, I say with Paul, there is no mediator betwixt God and man but Christ Jesus, his Son. And whatsoever they be who call or pray to any saint departed, they spoil Christ Jesus of his office. Hamilton's position was Christ alone. He didn't leave the world guessing as to what his thoughts were about Christ and his cross. He actually wrote a short treatise entitled Patrick's Places. John Frith, before his own martyrdom, translated and published this document in English and he writes Patrick's places this is his view of the law and the gospel and Christ the law saith pay thy debt thou art a sinner desperate and thou shalt die the gospel saith Christ hath paid it thy sins are forgiven thee be of good comfort thou shalt be saved The law saith, make amends for thy sin. The Father of heaven is wrath with thee. Where is thy righteousness, goodness, and satisfaction? Thou art bound and obliged unto me, to the devil and to hell. The gospel saith, Christ hath made it for thee. Christ hath pacified him with his blood. Christ is thy righteousness, 
thy goodness and satisfaction. Christ hath delivered thee from them all. Christ alone. Seven of the thirteen articles by which the Roman Catholic Church accused Patrick Hamilton of heresy that day, dealt with the great Reformation subject of justification by faith alone. That was the dividing line in Reformation times. That remains the dividing line today between truth and error on the subject of God's salvation. There are basically two religions in the world. I know men and women are divided into so many different camps. All of these religions, including some modern ones like Scientology and all the rest of it, there are only basically two religions in the whole world. One is a many works religion, where the sinner works his way into the favor of God by his own efforts and ultimately into his heaven. But no matter what quarter that comes from, and it's the mainstay of Roman Catholicism, of Islam, of Buddhism, Hinduism, Mormonism, JWism, in fact of all the world's religions outside of the beast, Christianity, no matter what they say, this is false religion. The Bible plainly declares in scripture such as Romans 3 and 20, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, that it is trusting In our works, that we will be saved? Absolutely not. It's going to be vanity. That's empty. That doesn't work. Romans 3 and 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in God's sight. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So on one side there is the many works religion. And it doesn't work. Or there is the one work religion. By which we mean that a poor sinner in all of his guilt and shame submits himself to the one work that Christ has accomplished on his behalf on Calvary. The finished work of the cross. And by that he receives a saving interest through simple faith. Romans 3, 23 to 26. For all of sin. And come short of the glory of God. How do we get back from that dreadful position being justified? How are we justified? How are we saved? Freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And that's what Patrick Hamilton preached in Scotland to be saved We are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. What is justification? Our shorter catechism asks the question. Question 33 answers justification. Is an act of God's free grace wherein he pardoneth all our sins and accepteth us as righteous in his sight only form the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. Patrick Hamilton taught. There's only one way to God, through Christ alone. And he preached that with clear, sustained emphasis. And that friar, Alexander Campbell, dubbed the Black Friar in this trial, he tossed other charges at Hamilton through this farcical trial. And again and again, Hamilton came back, preaching Christ. One of his responses, brother, he said, it ought to be the preaching of the true word of God that should put the people in remembrance of the Blood of Christ and their salvation. Do you know something? We need to make sure this emphasis lies at the heart of preaching today. Again and again and again, people need to hear, no works of merit now I plead, but Jesus take for all my need. No righteousness in me is found except Upon redemption ground, and the righteousness that I find there on redemption ground is not mine, but it's the righteousness of Christ. Puritan preacher Thomas Watson, speaking of Jesus the mediator, said the Greek word for mediator signifies a middle person, one that makes up the breach between two disagreeing parties. God and us were at variance by sin, now Christ mediates and becomes umpire between us. He reconciles us to God through his blood. Therefore, he is called the mediator of the new covenant. There is no way of communion 
between God and man, but in and through a mediator. This is our message. And we cannot, more we dare not deviate from it. Because it remains the sinner's only hope. In that tribunal, on the way to the stake, they charged him as being a heretic because of his desire that all men would read and understand the word of God. Because of his desire, the people would forget about the saints and the Virgin Mary as some kind of mediators through which they could approach God and go straight, direct to Jesus Christ, the only mediator. The word of the Lord, the way to life. And finally, an issue they brought up was the warmth of love. Well, that's my title for it, the warmth of love. What they did was they denounced Patrick Hamill as an heretic because he claimed that masses and services for the dead offered supposedly to help the souls of the dead through the pains of purgatory were of no value and that purgatory did not exist. Here's what they said about him. Heretic, thou sayest, it is all in vain our labors made for them that are departed. When we sing soul masses, psalms and dirges, that services for the dead, which are the relaxation of the souls that are departed who are continued in the pains of purgatory. What did Hamilton answer? Brother, I have read in the scripture of God of no such a place as purgatory. Nor yet believe I that there is anything that may purge the souls of men but the blood of Christ Jesus. Which ransom standeth in no earthly thing, nor in soul mass, nor dirge, nor in gold, nor silver, but only by repentance of sins and faith in the blood of Christ Jesus. No pains of purgatory for him. He wouldn't accept that. For he was convinced. Faith in the blood of Christ Jesus wouldn't land him after death into some kind of a purifying center such as Rome's imaginary purgatory. It wouldn't land him in there, but the blood of Christ would conduct him straight into the holy pleasures of Christ's banqueting house in heaven after his death. Patrick Hamilton was confident, just as another fellow preacher and fellow martyr who would be put to the stake in Scotland in 1543. George Wishart was, because Wishart, as he faced the fires of martyrdom, he said, the grim fire, I fear not. I know surely that my soul shall sup with my Saviour this night. From earth, right into heaven, nothing in between. And these persecuted children of the Lord shared a longing. That is common to all persecuted saints. In all ages, in all parts of the world. A passion, a desire for heaven. Don't we read in Hebrews 11, verse 13, 14, 16. These all died in faith. Not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off. And were persuaded of them. And embraced them. And confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth for they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country but now they desire a better country that is unheavenly turning round to the tribunal no doubt in frustration and exasperation the friar Alexander Campbell said my lord archbishop You hear he denies the institutions of Holy Kirk and the authority of our Holy Father, the Pope. I need not to accuse him anymore. That's an interesting description. Holy, Holy Kirk, Holy Roman Catholic Church, and Holy Father, the Pope, indeed. One of Patrick Hamilton's judges that day Sitting on the tribunal bench was Patrick Hepburn, a prior of monks who had, just to emphasize how holy he was, 
11 illegitimate children and boasted of his adulteries and they later promoted him to Bishop of Moray. Another trial judge was Abbot David Beaton, who later became a cardinal, spent his nights with prostitutes, his days in burning people for reading the Bible. That was your holy Kirk. Not a lot has changed. It was not too long after his able and worthy defense of his preaching before this tribunal in St. Andrews that Patrick Hamilton left earth and entered our Lord's banqueting house. It wasn't too long, but it was longer than it should have been. He was taken to a stake in front of St. Salvatore's College in St. Andrews at noon. His persecutors attached him to that stake by means of an iron band around the middle of his body. They lit the faggots, the timber, to try and ignite the thing. First attempt failed, though the bag of gunpowder exploded into his face and burned his face. The second attempt to ignite all the faggots again failed. They had to bring others. The third time they had to bring more faggots in. And they burned him slowly for those six hours. A desperate trial, but he endured it with great grace. There's a man of 24, years of age, embracing the flames of earthly fire that he might enter in through the gates of an eternal heaven where he would be welcomed by one who had died more tragically than he. You know something? The news of Patrick Hamilton's burning produced joy among the Catholics. The doctor of Louvian thanked Beaton for his services, that's the archbishop, his services to the faith and congratulated him almost with envy, he and the University of St. Andrews, about the honor it had earned by such an edifying display of Catholic zeal. Patrick Hamilton's death caused grief among the reformers. Where he'd been over in Germany, they heard what had happened to him. At Marburg, their grief was equaled only by their admiration for the man Lambert, who had been one of his tutors, said, he came to your university out of Scotland, that remote corner of the world, and he returned to his country again to become its first and now illustrious apostle. He was all in fire with zeal to confess the name of Christ. And he has offered himself to God As a holy, living sacrifice. The Roman Catholic Archbishop in St. Andrews that day thought he was putting out a little flicker of light when he took Patrick Hamilton to the stake and burned him. Actually, he lit a fuse that spread the Protestant Reformed faith across the entire nation of Scotland. It was rather said tongue-in-cheek, a short time after Patrick Hamilton had been martyred, the reek or the smoke of Patrick Hamilton has infected as many as it did blow upon. The news of his death did echo through Scotland. People became curious. Why did they burn him? What was he telling? What was his message? Let us hear it. Patrick Hamilton's ministry lasted but one year in Scotland, but it catapulted the gospel of grace to his countrymen. Twenty years later, the spiritual successor of Hamilton, John Knox, took the helm of the Reformation. We know what happened then. But what does the life, in closing, what does the life and the ministry and the death of Patrick Hamilton say to us on this Reformation Sunday? His work was complete at 24. The question comes to me today and comes to you, what have I done? What have I accomplished for Jesus? What loyalty have I shown? What hardships have I borne? What souls have I won? Who have I influenced for Christ? What glory have I brought to Jesus? We'll only answer these questions Positively, if we go down the road Patrick Hamilton did with those three main points of emphasis 
The word of God, the Bible. Let the people hear it. The way to life. Approaching God only through Christ. Let the people know. The warmth of love. We're not having our pockets pilfered by paying up against some imaginary purgatory straight to heaven. Redeemed saints of the Lord are heading. Let's tell out the word of God that emphasizes the way to life and that brings us into the warmth of love in heaven. This is the day of my opportunity. This is the day of your opportunity. And we must not miss it, but spread abroad our master's fame. God help us to do it.